What the hell was Alabama thinking? That is the question that was asked all over the United States in the past couple weeks. Hey, I'm Kristen Hawkins. This is the new episode of Explicitly Pro-Life. All right, so let's dive into what happened in Alabama. The Abortion Life Protection Act was passed and signed into law last week. Uh, What is so, I think, shocking for people across the country about this bill is that it bans abortion flat out. Most people had no idea this bill was coming up for a vote and that it was going to be passed. This is different than other bills that ban abortion, like a 20-week pain-capable bill or an 18-week pain-capable bill, or even like Georgia and Ohio's six-week heartbeat uh, bill that bans abortions after a fetal heartbeat has been detected. The author of this bill, an actual female author of this bill, state representatives, uh, she believes that her bill is going to pose a a better challenge to Roe versus Wade um, because it bans abortion flat out. And it says that the state of Alabama finds that life begins at conception, which is uh, something if you read in the court's opinion in Roe versus Wade, the Supreme Court said that basically they didn't know when life began, that it was a question for philosophers uh, and religious scholars. And so they weren't going to wade into it. But if it was ever proven that life began Um, at conception that that would ultimately change their findings on Roe v. Wade and Doe versus Bolton. So uh, the the citizens of Alabama actually voted and affirmed that life begins at conception. So the legislators were doing what the citizens wanted, what the will of their citizens wanted. Um, so this ban was passed. Uh, it was signed into law by a female governor. Now, what the left, the abortion left, wants everyone to know is that there was 25 male senators. They were the final vote uh, allowing this bill to move forward. They don't talk about the fact that it was a female legislator uh, that brought this bill to the floor and that it's a female governor who signed this bill into law. And by the way, the left really doesn't care about gender when it suits their purpose because no one ever talks about the fact that there were seven male justices and who actually gave us Roe v. Wade and Doe versus Bolton. It was seven men, uh, and or that was two men that founded NARAL Pro-Choice America, Bernard Nathanson and Larry Ladder, who sold Betty Friedan that lie that abortion was needed in order to set women free, who made sure abortion was included in the second edition of Feminist Mystique. So they don't really care about gender. It's only when they get angry and doesn't serve their purpose, right? So this bill gets passed and all hell breaks loose across America. People are free out, women are crying. Uh, the media is saying women are scared. They don't know where they're going to turn. I mean, what are they going to do without legal abortion? So I'm going to today in this episode, I want to break down some of the top objections to the Alabama bill uh, that we're hearing from the other side. I think there, you know, there are pro-lifers who are concerned about this bill saying, does it go too far strategically? Is it is it a good bill for us to be debating when we know we're winning on late term abortions? Um, we know we're winning on second and third trimester abortions. We're winning on conscience rights. We're winning on a lot of things when it comes to public opinion opinion on abortion. And I do think that's a valid question. Strategically, is this where we should go right now um, in the pro-life movement? Should we focus on banning all abortions or should we focus on maybe just when the heart begins to beat? Because I will tell you, uh, Students for Life is doing some interesting research right now and I can't give away the details, but I was listening to uh, a number of qualitative interviews that were taking place with mushy middle millennial women not long ago and heartbeat there is something there. Uh, there's definitely something there. Women, uh, mushy middle women, the, I don't like abortion, but I, I, I couldn't tell someone else not to have abortion. That type of, that's how I define as mushy middle. When you were able to explain uh, to a woman that uh, the heart begins to be at six weeks, uh, that was a, a pretty powerful point in those interviews, much more so than, than conception, sadly. But we have a long way to go. But All right, so I'm going to break down some of the the top things we're hearing 
I had to go on national TV and defend uh, my beliefs uh, uh, with a survivor of a sexual assault who was pro-abortion on the other side. Um, so I had to spend a few hours studying and practicing for that appearance. So I have some of those talking points here that I want to share with you. Um, and hopefully this will be helpful and inform your conversations moving forward on Twitter, on Facebook, in your church, in your, you know, in your, um, in your pew at church, um, or in, you know, the dinner table. I think this is something that pro-lifers cannot afford to be silenced on. We have the momentum. The other side is going to try to push us, um, and make us basically shut up and we can't shut up, uh, because we're in the right. Um, we, st we stand on the side of science. We stand on the side of human rights. So first thing, let's talk about rape. Um, I think any time when rape and abortion comes up, in in every pro life apologist will tell you this, right? The first thing that you have to do um, is acknowledge the horrific nature of rape, because often when people, not necessarily on TV, but when you're having a dialogue with someone about abortion, and rape comes up. A lot of times, they're not really asking um, what you know; they're asking if you're human, um, and and I think that's so so important that the person you're having discussion of, about abortion with understands that you are a human being, uh, and you sympathize, uh, with other human beings who've gone through something as horrific as rape. So I think the first thing you have to do is you have to acknowledge, uh, the horrificness of rape, that there is nothing, um, else beyond killing a person that I can imagine is more horrific than rape. And, um, and there's nothing that can be used to justify rape. Um, so I think we have to first, anytime you're having a discussion, you have to start out with just acknowledge uh, the horrificness of rape. Acknowledge that no one is pro-rape. No one is pro-sexual assault. Um, I think from there you, you go on uh, to talk about the humanity of the child. Um, Thankfully, the circumstances of our conception, the circumstances of our birth, um, they, they don't make us more or less of a human being. We are a human being simply because uh, we are a human being, right? We're a human being because we were created by two human parents. Um, we are a human being who has rights um, because we're a member of our species. Does that, I hope that makes sense. Um, other people... Don't get to judge your worth uh, or prejudge your potential. Your human life has value to you, the person who's living it. It also has value to your creator. Um, we don't issue points on birth certificates. Um, so, you know, some people aren't ranked higher on their birth certificate because of their parents, um, you know, income level, education level, their jobs, right? Um, there, you don't get more points on your birth certificate if there were candles lit and, um, some R and B music playing in the background when you were conceived, everyone just gets a birth certificate because they're a member of our human species, right? That they, that they, everyone, everyone shares in one thing and that's in our humanity. Because you have that humanity, you have that right to live. Um, and so I think that these are important points to be making is, you know, regardless of your circumstance of your conception or anyone's circumstance of conception, you have what I have, and that's humanity. You have human rights, and we share those things. In fact, our humanity is really the only thing we have in common with everybody else in the world. You know, we have different face, different backgrounds, different body types, different skin colors. Our humanity is the only thing that keep that is share. We share all of us that we all of us share. So I think that's important to to note, um, and, and really, and it's this is a difficult. You know, this comes up to especially if you're talking with someone who's a survivor of sexual assault. This is difficult because um, this is a logical discussion that you're having. Uh, you're making a rational discussion. Um, I also think it's really frustrating when the abortion left brings up the issue of rape because it's demeaning to those survivors of rape. 
um, who've courageously chosen life. It's, and it's surely demeaning to those children, to those human beings alive today, living their life who were conceived in rape. Because of the past two weeks, all we've heard on Twitter online is basically, if you're conceived in rape, your life isn't worth living, that you shouldn't be given a right to life, that somehow you're less of a human than other human beings. Uh, and that's just wrong. That's plain wrong. There's nobody who can tell you, um, that you are less of a human being than somebody else because of how you are conceived. Now it's, now it's frustrating is when you're having this discussion with somebody else, um, they're not, they'll agree with you. They'll say, oh yeah, well, if your friend, uh, you know, is today living and, and is here on earth and is, you know, it was conceived in rape, of course that person has value. And then the question is, well, why do they have value and not the preborn fetus? And it's always going to come down, it comes down to, you can't see the preborn child. You don't identify with the preborn child as a member of our species. Therefore, you're willing to say that an adult who's living today, living on earth is what I hear sometimes, uh, who was conceived in rape has value, of course, but the preborn fetus doesn't. Um, Because it always comes down and every argument about abortion always comes down to the fundamental question of what is it? And it, it all comes down down to that personhood of that child in the womb. So I do think it's demeaning that uh, the abortion industry continues to uh, bring up rape as a justification for abortion. Rape, um, abortions and cases of rape are rare. The Guttmacher Institute says that about 1% of all abortions are performed, are committed uh, because a mother became pregnant uh, in cases of rape. So what we see time and time again for the past 40 years is the abortion industry has used the horrific cases of rape and incest to justify all abortions. Because most of those people that you debate with on Twitter, spar with on Twitter, are people who are debating you in public about the Alabama abortion law or whatever a, a, you know abortion kind of ban is going on at the moment. If you say, fine, okay, take out cases of rape. So fine. There's a hypothetical, um, you know, exclusion for that case. Do you support the bill? Do you support the ban, uh, that, that bans all other abortions? And they're, they're not going to say yes, because at the end of the day, they're using rape. Uh, they're using the horrificness of rape to justify a hundred percent of all abortions. Um, so I think that's important to bring up, um, couple other things I think when you're talking about this issue to bring up, you know, obviously the violence of abortion, um, is not going to solve the violence of rape. You're only actually furthering the cycle of violence in a woman's life. Um, you know, sometimes I've seen graphics, you know, of the abortion doesn't unrape you. And I think that's a pretty callous way of saying it to somebody, but that's true, right? Uh, having an abortion isn't going to rid yourself of the trauma of the rape. Um, you're still going to deal with the trauma. You also have the common trot out the toddler, uh, which I said, you know, earlier is it always comes down to what is it? You know, if you do the try out the toddler exercise with folks about rape, uh, say, you know, say she courageously decides to parent her child and she gives birth and she's raising her child as a single child. She's going through healing, um, because of the sexual assault. And then one day her son wakes up, he's two years old and looks exactly like her rapist. And she starts having flashbacks. Um, it starts triggering, you know, memories of the rape that she thought she had gotten over. It's getting so bad. She, she's getting, you know, thoughts about having thoughts about murdering her child. Do you think she should be, she's justifying her murdering her child and ending the life of her child? No person, uh, would say yes. Why? Because we, as a society, see that two-year-old child as fundamentally, mental, fundamentally different than the pre-born child. So once again, the question is, what is the difference? What is the pre-born inside of, inside of the mother? Um, so that's another tool in your kind of toolkit uh, with your discussion that you're having about rape. Um, I also think, you know, one other... Um, thing that you can ask people to think about when you're talking about rape and abortion um, is that, you know, as a society, are we justified in punishing people because of their parents' crimes? 
And don't you think that's a slippery slope? You know, if my father went out today and committed a sexual assault, would his sexual assault survivor, so the woman who survived the sexual assault from my father in this hypothetical case, would she be justified in murdering me? No one would say yes to that. Absolutely not. So what's the difference? The difference, once again, is who is a child? What is the child? So there are some kind of, I think, hopefully talking points for you when, you, when you're talking about this. And I'm sure you probably are thinking of better ones than me at this moment. I did break my toe today. So my toe is thumping right now, but we're making this podcast happen just for you. Now, as you notice, some of those discussion talking points about rape get into this other thing bodily autonomy, right? Uh, where, you know, I saw the, the SNL skit where the woman had mine and it was pointing down towards her uterus and towards her stomach. And so you've got, um, the Hollywood stars, Alyssa Milano doing the sex strike, right? You know, no woman should have sex until these men understand that they're taking away our, our rights to our body, which is a fantastic, by the way, go sex strike. Like that is exactly what the pro movement has been saying for years. It's called abstinence, honey. Um, but you have having this whole argument about our bodies, men taking the right way, the right to our bodies. Um, fundamentally, even when you make some of these logical points about rape, it's going to come down to her body. And, and that's the tragedy of abortion, right? Is that for the first time in history, we we've pitted mother's rights versus child's rights. And that's what we've done with, with abortion. We've said, um, we get to decide whose rights matter more. Um, and, and that's what you see here with this bodily autonomy or, you know, agency to your own body. Sometimes you'll hear, uh, abortion leftists say agency. I believe a woman has full agency over her body. Absolutely. Um, pro-lifers believe women have bodily autonomy. Um, but your bodily autonomy, your agency to your body uh, never equals a right to kill another life. And that's the thing is, right, your rights to your body end when they start hurting somebody else's body. And you see this case, I mean, played out over and over again. Like, would anyone in our society say, oh, yeah, you're nine months pregnant, smoking up crack cocaine. Totally cool. No. No one in our today's civil society in America would say that a mother who's nine months pregnant smoking crack cocaine is, is morally in the right. Absolutely not. Why? Because she's doing something wrong. Why? Because her right to smoke crack cocaine stops when it starts harming another human person. But the abortion industry actually will defend they will defend uh, a woman's right to do this. Uh, 2004, Melissa N. Rowland in Utah uh, was a drug user, was, went into the emergency room, was told that her twins needed an emergency C-section uh, in order to live. She did not want to have a C-section because she was worried about the scar. She actually went outside for a smoke break. The doctors continued to um, reach out to her, tried to convince her to hurry up, give her, you know, consent to the C-section to give her children every chance to live. She eventually consented to the C-section. One baby died and the other baby was born addicted to drugs. The state of Utah wanted to prosecute her for killing her child because she knew that she was killing her child by not consenting to the C-section. And guess who came out and actually supported her? That's right, the abortion industry. Now, the National Organization for Women, uh, you can Google that story. It's pretty crazy. But you know what? At least they're being philosophically consistent. As awful as that case was, now understood that they had to stand for that woman's rights to do whatever she wanted with her body, including ingesting drugs that she knew was going to kill someone else's body. But the majority of Americans know that that's wrong. There's a, there's a reason why you can't smoke so many feet going into a hospital or why you can't smoke inside of a hospital, right? Because your right to, to put that tobacco in your body and your lungs stops when it could potentially harm other people who are maybe very sensitive to tobacco, like my children who have cystic fibrosis, a lung disease, right? 
So bodily autonomy, as much as the left wants to claim full bodily autonomy, full agency over their body, it actually doesn't exist. It only exists in their minds. All right. So another thing that um, you're going to hear, and, and, and this is kind of the undercurrent, I guess. Um, you know, I, I talked about the sex strike a few minutes ago. The other thing I think that we as pro-lifers need to be aware of what's happening in this discussion. Why is the left going insane? Why are they going nuts? Why are they unhinged? Why are we seeing more acts of vandalism, more threats of violence than ever before? I mean, ever since President Trump was elected and sworn in, uh, our number of reported vandalism, uh, vandalisms on campuses, threats of violence, our First Amendment cases have skyrocketed. Why? Because the left is unhinged. Why? Because they know what we know, that Roe is going to fall, and somehow they, that makes them feel justified in acting totally crazy and uncivil and incivil I guess um so what's really going on at the end of the day people are freaking out because when you take away abortion that's going to change how you behave I can't tell you how many times when you have discussions with mushy middle types who say I don't like abortion I don't think of, you know, I don't think abortion's right, but when you really drill into that conversation, what you hear is that I'm being responsible. I'm, I, I, you know, yes, I'm engaging in premarital sex, but I'm being responsible on birth control or whatever. I don't, I don't want to have abortion. So I'm on birth control. I'm using whatever, you know, artificial hormones this society is telling me I should pump into my body, but abortion's kind of there as my backup. In the back of my mind, abortion is my backup. And we have a whole society of women and men who are conditioned to believe this way. Even as distasteful as abortion may be to you, abortion in your mind is always your backup. And we've seen this proven, right? With the number of women who are Christians who say that they're against abortion before they actually had their abortion. I've spoken to many women who said, I, you know, I used to go out and pray in front of abortion facilities and then I got pregnant and then I had an abortion and I knew immediately what I did was wrong, but, but I did it anyway because abortion was seen as a backup. And so bills like Alabama's bill, laws that were passed in, you know, out in Georgia and Ohio and now Missouri, they're forcing you forcing Americans to reconsider how they live their lives. And that, my friends, is a much harder thing than a philosophical discussion. You may philosophically get it that abortion is a killing of unique, whole living human being, that abortion is a human rights violation. But then when you have to consider to stop having premarital sex, to, to change the way you engage in relationships... That's a whole different thing entirely because then it's personal. But that's really what you're seeing kind of at the, the underlying freak out here is that in a world, in a nation without abortion, you are going to be forced to reconsider your sexual decisions. That person you're having sex with, are you, are you okay with bringing a, a human being into the world? You know, reproduction is a very natural consequence of engaging in sex, heterosexual sex, I should be clear. I mean, I have to clarify that on the college campuses. But that's, that's what sex was, one of the reasons sex was intended, right? One of the big reasons why sex was intended, beyond unifying and bringing together man and wife. So if you have to reconsider the way you live your life, that's hard. But that's the underlying freak out that you're hearing. The men for choice, the guys that say that they're standing up for the ladies. My favorite was a guy at the University of Wyoming uh, who was holding up like a no uterus, no opinion sign or something a couple of weeks ago. That was crazy because he didn't have a uterus. Uh, but I don't think he looked at it. But all the ladies were in love with him because he was a pro-choice man. Um, men love abortion, pro-choice men. Why do they love abortion? Because it's their backup plan. Because if by some chance she becomes pregnant, 
And we know it happens, right? We know birth control is has a 9% annual failure rate. Um, condoms have an 18% annual failure rate. We know it happens. Abortion is their backup plan. They can continue to have sex, continue to use women's bodies how they see fit. And at the end of the day, abortion is always going to be there for them. I remember one time when I first got involved in the pro-life movement, I heard, um, I was talking with a pro-life lawyer and he was Catholic. Um, and this is before I converted to Catholicism. Um, and you know, these crazy Catholics. Uh, and he was like, you know, we have abortion cause we have birth control. And I was like, what, how is that possible? Well, you know, why did birth control mean abortion? Why can't you just have birth control? And then you have the very, you know, he was like, well, look at Griswold. So you look at the Griswold 1965 Supreme Court decision, right? That opened up this right, quote unquote, right to privacy in the bedroom, which is exactly what what the court, you know, cited, actually cited Griswold in Roe versus Wade, the right to marital or bedroom privacy. Um, So you have that kind of that legal reason. Yeah, okay, the right to birth control led to the right of abortion. But on the other level is this... The widespread use of contraceptives led to abortion because fundamentally sex was changed. Sex was, was different. It wasn't just between man and wife. Um, it was for whoever wanted to and whoever wanted to engage in it, uh, and have a little fun. And once sex was changed, there had to be contraception. There had to be abortion. All right. So I'm sure that made a few people mad. So let's move on. All right. So we talked about rape. Uh, We talked about bodily autonomy. We talked about sex and responsibility. I know I am like a barrel of laughs. You definitely want to bring me uh, to any dinner party you have because like this is what we're going to be talking about. Often I notice that when I'm at restaurants with other folks, um, and this happened to me just the other week, this fancy restaurant in Washington, D.C., slowly the wait staff will stop seating people at tables around me. So it becomes a really nice environment because we, you know, no matter how busy the restaurant is, uh, it tends to be there's a little buffer between me and everybody else. Okay, so the last thing I kind of want to talk about on this Alabama abortion ban. Um, that's the, I think that's the hashtag Alabama abortion ban. Um, and the thing you're going to hear is on miscarriage. Uh, this is the one that really threw me when I was following all the tweets after this bill was passed and after the Georgia heartbeat bill was passed, because I, I find it incredibly dishonest and insensitive that the abortion lobby is taking the pain of miscarriage, which so many so many American women and families have suffered through and using it to sort of justify abortion, keeping abortion legal. Let's be really clear. Abortion is not miscarriage. Natural miscarriage is fundamentally different than abortion and it always will be because abortion is the intentional taking of a human life. Comparing uh, abortion to miscarriage is crazy. I mean, so what the abortion lobby has been saying is, okay, well, if you're having, you know, if the Georgia bill is upheld and is enacted, women are suffering miscarriage, you're going to be at risk for punishment. That's not true. Never in the history of the United States has that been true. That just hasn't been true. And they're using this. And it doesn't even make sense because once again, it's about who's doing the killing. And how the killing is being done, who's being paid for it. Comparing, you know, a miscarriage to abortion is like comparing natural death to euthanasia. Someone is doing the killing in euthanasia and abortion, and they're getting paid for it. That is fundamentally different than a natural miscarriage or natural death. So don't let the abortion lobby, don't let them get away with using using that scare tactic that somehow somehow women who endure the pain of natural miscarriage are going to be under a microscope, are going to be examined and possibly get hauled into court under these abortion laws. This is just once again, another scare tactic of left. And quite honestly, it makes me freaking mad because they're using the pain of miscarriage to try to earn sympathy and try to win votes. All right, so I went through a couple of talking points and 
Uh, I know some things that I know you're probably having discussions about relating to the Alabama abortion ban. One last thing I do want to hit on is um, that I think was brought up that I really like. So Charlie Camosi, uh, he and I have sparred a lot on different things uh, relating to abortion. He's a Democrat for life, which uh, I'm not a big fan of anything for life, like labels, like feminist or Democrat, because I tend to find that if you try to put a label in front of your pro-lifeness, uh, that, that label, whatever it is, uh, tends to be weighted, um, higher than being against abortion. And uh, we've seen that before. And Charlie Camosi has definitely shown, uh, that, um, numerous times being a Democrat first and then pro-life second, but he had a good article in the Washington post last week. And I want to give credit to him. It's called extreme abortion restrictions must be paired with extreme support from mothers. And I agree with him. 100 percent um and the point is look if you're going to ban all abortions you better be ready as a state to handle the consequences of that and i think that's a really good discussion that's actually what the pro-life movement needs to be discussing right now is what are we doing and i think that's you know i think a a lot of it is a branding and marketing problem to be honest with you we have more than 2600 pregnancy centers and maternity homes across the country there's more than 8,000 federally qualified health centers government funded uh, federally qualified health centers Um, all these places are places of support to pregnant and parenting women both before the baby's born and then after but i know from polls that we've done even within students for life that the majority of americans don't know where to refer or send a friend who's experiencing an unplanned crisis pregnancy. So I think a lot of our problem is not only do we need to be providing more resources and getting um, and adding more, you know, resources of, you know, kind of to our toolkit at pregnancy centers, um, attorney homes, you know, adding on new programs. But I actually think we have to do a better job of branding ourselves as a community, as a state. I think a lot of times we're, um, we're a little concerned about branding ourselves and trying to make ourselves stand out from other pregnancy centers, maternity homes to win supporters, but we're not necessarily banding together, uh, to say, we've got you covered in in this, in this state or in this metropolitan area. Um, and so I think we do need to do more in providing resources and support. And we do have to be ready because let's face it, like in a post row America, she's going to turn to us. Planned Parenthood isn't going to be there helping her because there's no freaking money in it for them. They're not going to be there. Planned Parenthood's already preparing for a post pro America. They've got this miscarriage management plan that Abby Johnson's talking about, how they'll tell women where to go online to induce, you know, a miscarriage. And then you could go to Planned Parenthood and they'll give you an ultrasound and then they'll complete the miscarriage with the DNC. Um, So they'll call it, you know, miscarriage management. They're also mandating that all of their affiliates now offer transgender hormone replacement therapy. Why? Because it's, they believe it's their next cash cow. They are the only like national healthcare agency who can roll this out. So this is going to be their next big thing. In fact, like um, uh, right before, well, about a year before Cecile Richards retired, we um, protested. It was glorious this event she was at. It was fantastic. Planned Parenthood should never do events on the Capitol lawn because I can get right behind them and uh, bring our banners. But anyway. Um, half of Cecile Richard's speech, you know, this was a, a thing on Obamacare. Half of her speech wasn't on abortion. It wasn't on women's rights. It was on transgender rights. Uh, and so they've been very cautious and building their brand, building the reputation with individuals who are gender confused. Uh, so that's their next cash cow. They're already working on post row, uh, their post row cash plan. So women are coming to us. And so the question is, what are we doing? And so I liked, you know, Charlie and his Washington post article list some things. Now I think he and I have fundamental disagreements because I don't think the federal government is the solution to everything. I don't think, um, tax citizens more money and doling out more um unfunded mandate mandates is always going to be the right solution considering you know like social security trust funds running out this year and i have no idea whether or not my husband are going to get social security when we retire um so i think there's questions and i and and i think good pro-lifers can actually debate those things um in both understanding that we mean well and that we want what's best for women and children. But some of the things that Charlie mentioned were universal pre-kindergarten. 
I'm not a big fan of that just because I don't believe in giving the state more control over your children so they can indoctrinate them. And if, if you have any concern about that, you should look at the curriculum that's being um, going to be passed in Colorado, where basically Planned Parenthood gets to write the sex ed curriculum K through 12, and it's going to be interlocked into all, all of the um, studies like math. It's going to have to talk about transgender, uh, science. It's going to be crazy. Um, so you're not even going to be able to pull your kids out. So then he talked about that. I mean, I think that I think maybe more conservative approach would be better tax credits for parents, for, for nannies, for daycare, um, for, you know, someone, a babysitter. Uh, he, he mentioned a graduate scale of direct subsidies for childcare, similar to what I'm just saying. More legal protections for mothers at work based on family status. Hell yeah. Students for Life of America is actually hosting the first uh, pro-life national lobby day on paid family leave. Uh, I've written several op-eds about that. There's a conservative paid family leave program um, that will allow uh, parents to pull money out of their out of their basically their social security. Now, granted, we need to make social security uh make sure it doesn't, you know, collapse because that won't work either. Um, we talked about increased penalties for an outreach regarding inmate partner, intimate partner violence. Absolutely agree. Uh, dr- dramatic reformation of the adoption industry to be more friendly towards pregnant women and, and hopeful adoptive parents. Hell yeah. I think someone said the adoption tax credit in Alabama was only like a thousand dollars when I think you know normal adoptions today in America are twenty five to fifty thousand dollars. So yeah, a hundred percent. and then he had increased funding for the foster care system, which absolutely um, I don't think that necessarily will reduce abortions, um, but it'll be great for children. Um and with the foster care children were just like the children conceived in rape who apparently on Twitter didn't have the right to exist this past two weeks. So absolutely, let's let's protect our children in foster care um, and make sure that um, parents who are undergoing a time of stress or dealing with an illness or an addiction have a place to put their child safely and hopefully a place where they can be eventually re- reunited for their, ch- for their child. So yeah, so post Royal America, we are going to be the ones. There's a lot on our shoulders. We've got to make sure we have all the resources and support out there for her. We're also advertising those resources and support so she actually knows they exist. Um, that's why like our pregnant on campus program, Students for Life, is so freaking important because we need to transform our college campuses. Um, our goal in the pro-life movement is not only to make abortion illegal, but it's to make it unthinkable. And we elect politicians uh, to make abortion illegal and then we act to make it unthinkable Uh, so it's a twofold goal don't let anyone tell you it's one or the other it's twofold Um, So those are some of my thoughts about the Alabama abortion ban. Um, Hopefully this is helpful for you and your ongoing discussions and debates. Get active on Twitter and Facebook and engage with your family members. Engage with your friends about this issue. Don't let them, um, don't let them just kind of rule the conversation. You have the tools now in your tool belt. You have the conversation starters. You can get this started Um, and make sure, you know, just do it because people are watching. And every time you're out there, every time you put your thoughts out there, someone's paying attention. Uh, you're potentially converting someone. You're planting the seeds for conversion in others. So don't be afraid to do it. All right. Check you next time, guys. Bye. Bye.